Welcome to Surviving Society and Red Pepper's podcast collaboration, Beyond the Strikes. In these episodes, we speak to workers across the NHS, schools, railways and Royal Mail. This series places industrial action into wider debates about public ownership, working conditions, the economy, neoliberalism and, of course, capitalism. Are you interested in some further reading on social movements and left politics? You should be if you're listening to Survive in Society. Red Pepper is a quarterly magazine and website of politics and culture. It is a space for debate on the left and a home for open-minded socialists. Red Pepper is reader funded with a sliding scale subscription model, ensuring its content is available to all. Find the link to Red Pepper magazine in the episode notes. Hello everyone, I'm in the studio with Liam and we are interviewing Vic Chechi Ribeiro who is a science teacher and activist uh, based with the NEU. Vic, thank you so much for coming into the studio via a Zoom link to talk to us about your brilliant work. Thanks for having me. Um, just to say, listeners, I've been fully fangirling Vic because I found out that Vic's um, double barrel last name is because um, you also took your wife's name when you got married. So a proper ally here. Solidarity, comrades. Come on, solidarity, practically, practically uh, tackling the patriarchy. Um, so this episode is a really important one we're talking about um the teachers unions and we're talking about schools um when liam kindly put together these episode notes he sent them over to me and i was like oh my days schools are in trouble um they've been in trouble for a long time but sometimes when people put things well when you write things down in terms of what is actually happening i feel like it's very very powerful and just to read out a couple of bits of information that Liam put together for the episode notes of this show. Um, school spending per pupil in England fell by 9% in real terms between 2009 and 2010 and 2019 and 2020, the largest cut in over 40 years. Deprived schools have seen the largest of cuts. The national funding formula has continued this pattern by providing bigger real term increases for the least deprived schools than for the most deprived ones. Um, we've got a staff crisis, 12.8% of teachers leave the state education sector after one year. That's roughly 40,000 uh, teachers. Uh, teacher va- vacancies have almost doubled. Every day, 35 students are permanently excluded from schools. Excluded pupils are seven times more likely to have special educational needs and pupils on free school meals are four times more likely to be excluded. Government data suggests that 42% of current prisoners were expelled from schools no more exclusions the organization which we've had on this show a couple of times now say it is the majority of prisoners who were excluded from schools so we do have like a huge crisis on our hands i think it's probably worth just taking a few steps back in terms of think about what the purpose of the education system is you know we live in a capitalist society and the purpose of schools is to reproduce inequality so the fact there has been austerity funding cuts that there is exclusions which are on heavily ableist and racialized lines. No, those aren't moral failings from the government. That's the system being designed what it intends to do. So in terms of what I see work in schools, you see it from you know, children appearing and coming to school hungry. You see it in terms of class sizes. You see it in terms of teachers leaving the profession, not wanting to become teachers in the first place um, and we've seen it this year with you know, the biggest waves of strike action across schools in many many years and it's important that we don't see these individual um, things as isolated but all part of the same interconnected um, interconnected in terms of what's happening in terms of what the system is intended to do which is grade ration at the top so the richest go to the top universities and occupy the top positions and working class people don't and that's as simple as it is justifications for austerity don't necessarily make sense when we know that investment in education largely pays for itself through kind of greater returns in work um, less kind of societal costs um but you touched upon the the strikes there recently it'd be great if you could talk us through kind of the the history of the most recent wave starting with maybe the government's first offer which i think was maybe was it three percent last year or and then how yeah correct of- yeah so Teacher pay is set by the government annually through the STRB. Last year, they'd offered 3%. This is when inflation was running in 
double double digit figures. So we're looking facing at a seven percent real terms cut, and those numbers can seem ex- sort of abstract. But if you sort of link it to the fact that teachers are leaving the profession, and we've got a huge issue with recruitment at the moment, I think last year there was something like only forty seven physics trainee students in universities across the whole of England, you know, which wow. is completely unsustainable numbers. Our union and the union I'm in, the, the National Education Union, the NEU, um, decide to balance its members. Um, so the big barrier is the anti-trade union strike clause. So by law, no, we now need to have over 50% of members voting po- no, through the post, which is bigger barriers to taking part in democratic processes than you'd expect from, or what is expected from politicians at local government and in general elections. We won that ballot and now a lot of organising went into that in terms of speaking to members, make sure they would reps in schools, but also you know, going through those political arguments with members. You know, why are we take a strike action? Because it's about education, it's about schools, it's about the class size, it's about young people coming to school hungry. So we've had eight days of strike action this year and that's sort of you know, where where we've been up to this year one of the things it'd be really good to find out from you vic is the kind of support that the teachers have had so we've had in this series a variety of different union members from a variety of different sectors talk to us about what political education looks like um, in terms of unions and going on strike. But I think that schools in particular demonstrate a really particular case in that it's seen as a more universalised one because, sorry, in this country we all go to school and it would be good to know kind of from from your experience, what has been the kind of reception? Yeah, so when, we, when we've been on our picket lines um, on our strike days, we've proactively gone and leafleted bypasses, people walking by, but also gone into areas like shopping centres and town centres yeah. to build support. Um, so in schools, in preparation strike days, we've done training for members where we would answer common objections. So things like, what about the kids? Why do you hate the kids? They've missed loads of yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Um, but actually, if you frame it around, well, actually the, the status quo is harming students and actually sort of education system that your child deserves can only be won through you know, the struggle of workers that work inside schools. Um, but also sort of the idea that our working conditions and learning conditions of students are the same as well. I mean, you can't separate the two. So that's all prepared our members in terms of speaking to parents, carers and members of community on strike days. But also what's been really sort of pedagogical for teachers and support staff in schools on strike um, has been you know, going to sort of the rallies in towns and city centres. So we've been fortunate enough to take strike action on days alongside workers from universities, civil servants, um, support staff in in other sectors um, as well. And for for workers in schools who aren't necessarily the most politicised, sort of seeing that they're not alone and actually the issues around funding in schools is actually quite simple as happening in hospitals and for those who work in emergency services as well. So it's sort of two things there. One is building those bonds solidarity between the workplace community, but also raising the political consciousness of yeah. you know, trans members as well. Eventually you got uh, the government to move up to a 6.5% uh, pay offer, which was accepted in July. Um, and I guess that was accepted against the backdrop of kind of the leadership of your union saying this is as good as it gets basically uh take it or leave it um i was wondering if you could reflect a bit on that because we've heard similar things from uh, the royal college of nurses when we had the nhs guys in um where basically there's a, a significant uh stakeholder a significant number of members who want more basically tens of thousands i guess in the case of the neu and the rcn who are pushing for higher pay deals but union kind of membership basically saying nah this is it yeah, I, I think it's it's important to make a distinction between those at the very top of our union who are paid by the union, union officials, you know, who we would classify as being a trade union proxy, and those who are based in the workplace who we you know, describe as being the rank and file. Um, if you are the workers who've been out on the picket lines, who've been engaged and lived that strike day to day, 
your confidence and what you want to win will be materially different to those who are at the very top of the union who say a general secretary who's on six figures who spends all their day waiting for a call for the part for education for negotiations so you've then got a bit of a tension there between those at the top and the bottom um the government did make its offer for 6.5 percent we believe we could have got more than that because the fact that they were moved was done through strike action um so the fact that our union leadership made a recommendation to accept um if we had an organized rank and file base where lay members across different workplaces had the confidence to fight for more a reject vote could have won but not quite there yet but if you look at the figures though twenty-five thousand any members voted to reject and that gives you a bit of a basis for what might be you now quite a militant rank and file um moving forward Vic, do you know what? You're one of the first union organisers for me that's really carefully and clearly articulated like the difference between rank and file and your kind of general secretary, like in practice. Like, because sometimes people say it and I'm like, what, what do they mean when they're saying it like that? And I guess for people that are outside of union organising, sometimes it could, well... I'll just I'll speak for myself like it's slightly disheartening to know that like there's even a kind of a hierarchy within a collective that's supposed to be working for the collective and like I guess you need well society tells us that you need someone quote unquote in charge but when that person in charge is so this this not attached to as you say the rank and file like that that that's a clear issue with the unions. And I don't know, I feel like we've been talking about this intermittently, Liam, across the series, but like, I think you've really demonstrated to me very clearly what the issue is. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's, it's, it's a structural basis of trade unions yeah. in capitalist society. The fact that where you have half a million members, the union has got to employ people to have databases, check memberships, and to do the negotiation um so the issue isn't to ignore a trade union proxy or leadership it's to subordinate it it's to make sure that our power as rank of our workers is so strong that it acts a bit like an electric fence the fact that they won't even try making a decision that we won't be happy with because they know that they wouldn't be able to carry out we're not quite there yet but the fact that we have been able to take strike action nationally for the first time since the Conservatives put their latest restrictions in 2016 is a positive step. So we've got to see this as a step forward in terms of organisation, but we haven't got everything we wanted, but we've got to make sure that we're ready the next time. Actually, we're able to reflect on what our weaknesses are because that's the only way that we can improve them moving forward. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty spot on, Vic. And I, I would say the same thinking about the recent wave of industrial action. It's been like, incredibly heartening to see these massive disputes, but it shouldn't be the end point. It's, it's the very, very beginning. And we do need, I think, a lot of reform within the trade union movement. And I think you're kind of touching on it a little bit there when you're saying about the weaknesses. Uh, I know that within the education unions, there's been a lot of beef, basically, between the kind of the NEU, the GMB, Unite and Unison. So some background. Uh, late 2022 the three big unions or the kind of GMB, Unite and Unison made a formal complaint to the TUC saying that the NEU were organising support staff when they shouldn't be because those workers belong, air quotes, belong to those three unions. Why do they care? The TLDR is that the NEU... Too ended, long, didn't read it. Then <laughs> is that the NEU ended up getting fined over 150 grand by the TUC for organising workers that weren't uh, theirs. Why? why indeed no so, this country's not serious it's actually not serious <laughs> right it's going sorry Vic. Um, <laughs> so the most unions are under the umbrella of the tuc which is the trade union congress um if you're under the tuc's umbrella you've got to sort of signed certain recognition agreements um and it's a bit it's a bit weird with teaching and support staff so support staff in school sets teaching assistants, administrators, those have historically been represented as 
with the same trade unions that are in local government, so council workers. Um, so particularly since the pandemic, we've seen the NEU double the number of reps in their schools. Um, and what we also have seen is when the NEU was formed, it merged from the NUT, the National Union for Teachers, and the ATL. The ATL had within it support staff, so the NEU that formed from that merger is an education union, it's not just a teachers union. So it's sort of been this bit of a grey area where officially we've not proactively said to support staff, join our union, but support staff, you know, they can make their own decisions. If they're in a school where there's only an NEU rep, well, they're going to join the NEU, aren't they? Um, and particularly um, during this dispute, the support staff unions weren't able to cross their, they couldn't get the votes needed to take strike action. So the only unit on strike was the NEU. So even more support staff workers joined the NEU. So you got to think, if you're GMB, Unison Unite, what you should do is think, okay, why was that? We weren't organising that. Let's make sure we are next time. Or you could cry to the TUC and get the NEU fined instead. And that's, that's what they did. They want more members so they've got more power. I think that ultimately is the bottom line. I mean, Vic, correct me if you're wrong, but the unions are very territorial. Um, and when you sign they up, are. Yeah, very massively so. And when you sign up to the TUC, the the kind of sectors are kind of demarcated, basically, under some like principles that were literally written in like the 1930s. So it's like, mm. right, this union does that, this union does that, this union does that, and that's the way it is, full stop. Um, so when you get kind of more active or militant unions, which I guess is the NEU in education, signing up support staff... The other unions are a bit shook because they're like, "Oh, this is actually these are members." And it in sounds like a gen- where, gen- it sounds like a generational issue. And I mean, it is. It's just mindless bureaucracy, I guess, is what what I would say. But the TUC obviously does wield a lot of power um, and influence. And if you are affiliated to the TUC, which unions pay to be a member of it, basically, you have to pay by their rules. Yeah, and and again, um, it's it's sort of linked to the idea of the diff- interest between trade union officials, paid staffers from the union. It's yeah. Blocks and rank and file workers if you're a rank and file unison member or unite member you you will just happily work alongside any EU members you wouldn't want to see six figure fines during an industrial dispute that could go on things like budget funds and things like that but if you're you know a general secretary or a paid officer for a union your wage is dependent on your membership numbers and if you see those numbers going down even if it's because those workers want to join a more organised union, you're going to have a problem with it. That makes sense. But it's mad, though. Yeah, it's absolutely mental behaviour by everyone involved. I was wondering if you could reflect a bit more on kind of... In my understanding of it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the teaching support staff aren't included in the 6.5%, the pay offer. They're not They're not part of that. Yeah, correct. Yeah, That's so, terrible. Yeah, yeah it's, because they're it's a separate awful. union. It's, it's one of the big drivers for the reject, though, was that it's sort of left support staff um, out to dry. So in my school, we had support staff who refused to cross the picket line on on eight days, and they lost their their pay from that. And we've been organising alongside them by saying, look, you know, when you're out, we'll be out with you. But you, now we've had this accept vote, and it's sort of left them, you know, like I said, out to dry. So it's it's not great at all. And I guess also from kind of like an organising standpoint, having two separate what we would call bargaining units, so teachers, one group, support staff, another group, not in the same union, massively undermines your strike because when the teachers are out, the support staff can stay on and they obviously, if they're on low pay, which a lot of those people are, they're incentivised by management and, you know, the financial reality to go into work, which hinders the ability of the NEU to shut down a school or have, like, the most amount of impact. So I'd be interested to hear from you, Vic, about, like, how how we can bring those two two groups of workers together um which i guess has to be a key battle moving forward and also just to say that like in a cost of living crisis like the people that are earning the least have been shafted like it just the union is really complicated isn't it and it's it's pretty sad it's it's devastating to be honest that like even within union organizing it's it's stratified by class and I suppose in terms of a solution, it's it's to continue organising support staff yeah. workers 
because uh, most most support staff workers aren't in a union and um, quite often they might be on agency contracts or outsourced um like you said um on average earning less more likely to be women racialized mm. as well so the, these are the groups of workers that we need to be organizing so in the NEU, that would mean for me as a workplace rep i'll be ignoring the tuc i will be recruiting support staff and i'm going to do so and placing pressure on my own union and asking other members from Unity United to place pressure on their unions to show how ridiculous this ruling is. Because um, the only like, the only solution to this is to be better organised as workers across the workplace. But um, no, one of the barriers that was mentioned was about having those sort of separate separate bargaining units. Um, no, the NEU is an industrial union, um, and I think that should be modelled that you sort of move towards. I think you sort of see a similar dynamic play out in university. So with the UCU strikes, you know, you sort of got different support staff workers going in, but you've got academics on the picket line, which makes it more difficult to do the ultimate aim of the strike, which is to you know, shut down the workplace. Not very widely known what an academy is, but they're basically taking over. I think the latest data I've seen is that 40% of primary schools are now academies and 80% of secondary schools are now academies. And the government recently put out a wire paper that said their goal was to have all schools turned into academies by 2030. Um, that was initially going to be, I think, this year or last year, but everyone kicked off, so they've pushed it back to 2030. So I wonder if you could explain a little bit to the listeners, Vic, about uh, kind of academisation, um, why it's happening and, w- and what the dangers of it are. Yeah, so academisation was another idea, another great idea from New Labour. <laughs> Yep. Um, so Add it to the list. Right? <laughs> um, so inspired from charter schools in the US, um, and like a lot of new labour ideas around academies, around securitisation, um, around police in schools. Um, when the Tories got elected, they then sort of took that sort of part privatisation framework and then fully went with it. So. Previously, schools used to be under local education authority control. Um, that would mean that you know, the council would be responsible for um, planning student places, make sure that schools were in the right areas um, within a council ward, but also ensuring that schools collaborate, collaborated in terms of CPD, um, you no, know, sort of generally, sort of for the community. Um, and also, as a citizen, you know, they're accountable to you because you can vote and take part in council elections. Um, so what academisation has done is essentially part privatised the education system. So instead of local education authorities running schools, instead you've got hundreds of um, education providers, um, which has really fragmented the education system. So, for example, I live in Manchester, in Manchester, Previously, there would have been one local education authority, but now there are must be, you know, come up to almost 100 um, different multi-academy trusts that run schools across Greater Manchester. Um, and that poses several problems. One, it means that those people who run multi-academy trusts can pay themselves a lot more. Um, so the CEO of Harris Academy... That's the one, in it? Harris Academy, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, Lord Harris, who's a conservative lord, who sort of made his money in carpets. Um, he's it's named after him. But the CEO earns over four hundred thousand. Uh, you have got schools in this country that can't afford glue sticks, and this guy earns like four hundred thousand pounds a year. So it's absolutely obscene. So how does um, the funding just to roll back, Vic? How does it work in terms of funding? Yeah. Yeah, so the funding comes from comes from you, comes from no, yeah. Tax Come on, yeah. tell them. Yeah. So what what are we paying? Um, What's our where's our money going into Lord Harris's pocket? Yep. Yeah. Um. So the more students in a school, the more money that they get. So it encourages competition between different schools and multi academy trusts. So where a system like health education should be based on collaboration and working together, working for the people, instead you've got all these market forces um, and competition between schools. So the school that I work in, 
there's a secondary school that must be a 15 minute walk away. We've never done anything with them. You know, there's loads of potential opportunities there to share staff, do training together, drop in, see what works well. But we're we're both in competition in terms of you know both being schools in in the same area of Manchester, which is a real shame. Um, and the final point in terms of final barrier, in terms of union organising, um, normally in Manchester we would do all our negotiation, pay, condition contracts with one employer, which is the local education authority, but now it's you know, lots of lots of different ones, which means that multi-county trusts can set their own pay scales, can set their own terms and conditions. Um, but also, if you also add in the pressures with school lead tables and Ofsted, multi-county trusts also may be more likely to off-roll students. So students who've been excluded and that want the results, get rid of them. They're not there. Um, cool, yeah, so yeah, lots of you know, different barriers that canalisation is brought in, but brought in by new Labour member. So thank you, Tony Blair. It's mad because I think we've had, we've definitely had episodes on Surviving Society before we spoke about we've, where someone's broken down to us what academies actually are, but I think it's really important to keep coming back to them um and your description was so clear vic thank you so much because it is it's a it's atrocious yeah it's kind of a secret scandal really yeah that's one a secret scandal appreciates what's going on i think there's also it's worth highlighting that the tories brought in in 2012 or something that academies can hire unqualified teachers so a mm. lot of the teaching standards are significantly worse they tend to do uh, worse on ofsted uh, rankings even though the kind of justification for them is that they improve uh, you know teaching quality or whatever and as kind of Vic said they have this kind of layer of like highly paid bureaucrats that are doing pretty much jack all yeah. um, and taking a lot of government funding for it bad news basically on that front really depressing and also just thinking of it in terms of race and class as well like where's the protection for the most marginalised young people and families within these academies like there is no for the academies or the the bureaucrats within them, what is the intention? What like what is the incentive for them to look after people that need more care? There isn't. Yeah, absolutely, and that's where you know you need that resistance. So in Manchester, we have an excellent organisation called No Police and Schools. Oh, big up um, Roxy. Yeah, uh, big up Roxy and Kids of uh, Colour. Big up, yeah, big up. Yeah, as well as like Kids of Colour, like No More Exclusions as well. Yeah. Um, what we need is like greater like linked up work between those organisations that are based in the community and have and have within them teach members with like school union groups. So like when we sort of talk about you know the sort of militant rank and file workers, you know, they should also have on their horizon abolition, anti racism, the, the presence of police in schools, things like that, as well as you know, winning on you no know, pay and conditions and jobs. Yeah, I guess that does move us on quite nicely to like what you were saying at the beginning, Chantel, some of those stats around the kind of schools to prison pipeline. Like The majority of prisoners uh, in UK prisons at the moment were excluded from school at some point. And I know groups like No More Exclusions have been doing like really good work around this. Big um, up Zara B and, and others. Yeah. How, how is that being kind of brought into union organising? Um, what does the future look like that on, on that front? It's, it's a link to the strength of workplace organising the workplace. So the NEU has passed motions looking calling for a moratorium on exclusions. Um, but without there being that level of political education from teachers, whether that's carried out or not is, is a different thing altogether. And just like in other aspects of society, you know, there are racist reactionary teachers. So that that is that's a statement of fact and so that political education that we do within union groups in schools, as well as you know, talking about capitalism, as well as talking about how things like nationalised energy could pay for the pay rise, it should also you know, discuss things like racism and imperialism as well. Um, it should also talk about policing and things like that as well. Because in teaching, the dominant ped- ped- pedagogical technique um, really focus on hyper surveillance. So the idea that um, you're constantly looking at and checking on students' body language, the way they're sitting, the language they're using, 
And if you've got a teacher with reactionary views, that will lend itself towards racism and ableism. Um, I think you must have heard of Catherine Burbel Singh. Um, so she's the head teacher at Michaela School. And these are schools where students have to walk in silence on the corridors. Now, what, what's that teaching them? What part of life would you have to do that except for a prison? And that's where sort of the link between the two is. So um, there a lot more needs to be done in terms of the anti-racism um, in unions. Um, but I think that's a sort of the weakness of independent, rank and file power from teachers because that if it's not going to come from the top of the union, then it's got to come from grassroots organisers from below because there are significant numbers of anti-racist organisers in the schools, but are we talking to each other? Are we sharing resources? No. What does our network look like? And that's that's sort of a sign of our weakness that we need to improve on. Yeah, I guess it's also kind of when you're thinking about kind of the rate of exclusions and what you were saying about the academies, it's all part of that wider system, isn't it? Like if you have a heavily marketized system where everything's done on like ranks and grades and how good your marks are, you want higher marks, you're going to get rid of the problematic kids and there's no kind of wider conception of like education as a public good. It's all about kind of moving people on to the next stage so they can go and get a job in PwC and then happy days. Who are the most idolised and acceptable children to put through the system in order to contribute to the yeah mate sound like a marxist or something that's it <laughs> crazy marxist <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a communist so that's... yeah vic what is it like being a communist teacher on plague island it's yeah, that's a very good question i know um, see that's why i do this that's why i do this yeah <laughs> I think that the members of my school really respect that I'm open to my politics. Um, I'm, like, I'm quite open about being a communist. And when I sort of speak to my colleagues about the fact that you know, who's who's best who's best in place to run this school, you know, is it is it the government? Is it a CEO and six figures, or is it the workers? Not yeah, obviously it's us, isn't it? Mm. Okay, let's extend that. Who's the best to run our communities and society? Well, it's, it's us, isn't it? That's sort of sort of common sense mm. so it makes sense doesn't it in the classroom though you've got to be careful um yeah that's what i'm saying yeah increasingly a focus on anti-racist climate justice and communist workers in university schools so you've, you've got to be careful um because prevent again which was brought under new labor mm. um i can see that being used increasingly on left-wing organisers. Um, as we know, capitalism has no answers to the climate crisis or it's not going to find a way out of addressing the cost of living, inflationary crises. Those things have become more recurrent. And the government and the wider capitalist class, they see resistance to that that knowledge of resistance emerging out of schools and universities and the workers within them. So I think being on the left and being a teacher, you've got to be careful, but at the same time, sort of fight for the right to have political autonomy as workers. Now, our union organising shouldn't just be based on methods and practice. I should be proud and I should be able to openly, explicitly radicalise my colleagues for a better society so i love that i should be able to openly and explicitly radicalize my colleagues for a better society for all it's beautiful perfectly reasonable isn't it yeah and on that note vic where is the hope oh you you seem like a hopeful person to be honest yeah, yeah. like look there's plenty of hope like if, if you said to me that we would have seen the biggest wave of strike action in this country for, for decades. If you said that to me three, four years ago, I'll say that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the case. Mm. That wouldn't happen. So the fact that we have seen an upsurge in workplace militancy suggests that people see and people feel that the capitalist system isn't meeting their needs and they're finding answers through collective organisation through trade unions, um, through organisations in communities, things like that. So th there's hope there. Um, where I think we need to sort of 
move forward and have running alongside that is sort of that socialist or communist horizon. So our workplace organising that we do on paying conditions is linked to actually changing wider society. And if that's, you know, I'm, I'm a communist, so I, I believe only the working class can emancipate itself. So whether that's, you know, a, a mass communist party, whatever, that political project has got to run alongside what we do in trade unions, because too often trade union organising is separate. But actually, you know, we should be merging the two together. So, you know, whilst there has been many crises, and we are in those crises, you know, where there's oppression, there's resistance, and actually we've got capacities to collectivise that resistance into something better. I mean, I, do, I agree with you there on a lot of it. And a lot of kind of the union's political organising is tied to a political project. It's just that that project is like Keir Starmer's Labour Party or like they're very wedded to. So it's not like... I'm not. <laughs> you're out. You're uh, green, I'm aren't at, you? I'm a green. I'm green. We I'm a green. talk about that later. Yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> a critical green, but I'm not part of the Labour Party. It's not my people. Imagine kind of you had those parameters in place, like you had the movement, you had the political organisation that you wanted. Um, what would kind of be your... your like, your policies on education what would you want to see like your top three i think it's quite handy for people to have like these are the main issues this is what we want to see change in yeah like if if we were imagining a socialist education system firstly there wouldn't be any market forces so day one you'd be abolishing um ofsted league tables Boom. um We'd be abolishing the police. <laughs> Come on. Not just, not just from schools. <laughs> and then sort of secondly, sort of imagining what the purpose of school is. So rather than thinking that the purpose of school is is serving bosses and employers, it's actually serving the needs of people. Thirdly, just you know, having an education system where you know, every young person, you know, went through with with their dignity intact and no those three things no should be basic things but we haven't got them so that's what we need to be striving towards sounds good to me that's amazing big i've learned so much from you today thank you so much for joining us thank you i'm a teacher after all exactly that honestly like i'm sat here like i've learned so much teachers we need more teachers and they need to be paid better we do (laughs) and we will exactly and they will be paid better thank you so much for joining us Vic. yeah thanks very much for having me like i said i'm a massive fan of the podcast i was like fanboy oh it's chantel (laughs) (laughs) we're only here because of you it's about telling your stories and democratizing the work that you're doing so thank you very much listeners we'll see you again next week Thank you for listening to Surviving Society. To support our work, you can rate, review and subscribe to host or produce a series of Surviving Society. Get in touch with us via Twitter or Instagram.